shortly. And we, are, we are live. We are live on Woo-hoo, Facebook. My job live, is done today. Live on Facebook, live on the <laughs> Vibe Radio Network, and we are very thankful to have you all with us here again on another Monday night during this horrendous quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Construction started today in the house. Cheers. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, pardon us in advance if this week's episode might be uh, a little rougher on the edges. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's been... It was kind of hard to figure out, A, how to present this material, and B, as we said, construction started today at corporate headquarters. The kitchen is getting torn out. All that's left in the kitchen right now is the floor and the fridge. Refrigerator, yeah. So <laughs> it's been, uh, yeah, we're we're just... We're tripping over everything in various places around the house, so trying to get everything together, remembering where we stuck the power cords and the connecting cables and all of that. And we spent much of the last week... Uh, really moving things moving around, things around. So we can have space for them to launch the cabinets from and store materials in and our house looks like a cyclone has gone through it even the office looks like a cyclone has gone through it even more than normal <laughs> <laughs> the cat is not happy <laughs> the cat is totally beside herself it's been it's just it's been a week it's been a week it's been a week yeah. but you know, it, it's times like this where you really just kind of want to be able to, you know, kind of get out and, uh, and and do something. And there's not really much of anything that you can do just under the circumstances. It's uh, um, you, you're you're stuck at home for yeah. the most part. There's nothing. There's nothing to go out and do. You can't come join us on a tour. Um, um, depending on the park, depends whether or not you can hike locally. Um, not all the parks are open. Um, and you just segued right into that. I did. Yeah, she's not wasting I'm any good. time tonight. <laughs> um, and times like this, I really miss just being with friends around a fire, drinking beer, and telling stories. And uh, I would be doing that if we were out hiking as well. So uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some Honda hikes that as soon as we all can get the heck out of the houses, we can go take. Yes. But real quick, uh, hey to everybody for uh, thanks for joining us, uh, tuning in and joining us yeah. again tonight. We've got a few people joining us already, so Glenn, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. And uh, oh, we got Jules Vern, who just in time yet yeah, just Woo-hoo! made it. Kick back, drink <laughs> up, and quarantine. Patrick, yes, we are totally with you here tonight. So just uh, for your reference tonight, uh, we are drinking. Uh, well, I'm drinking Bold Rock again, and I have my Spike Jameson tea. As yes, well. yep, and uh, similarly, I got. Uh, Protocol Porter from Aleworks. So we're drinking Virginia bottled beverages tonight. Yes. And uh, yes. of course, Jameson always figures. It's like a tradition with our ghost stories. Jameson has to be taken before or after a tour. Yes. And, so. and I, well, I actually went a different route. I do not have Jameson tonight. Oh. I broke open the uh, cider cask. The Tullamore Dew? Uh, Tullamore Dew. Nice. So I haven't even taken a sip of it. This will be uh, giving it a try first time <laughs> on the air. So we'll see how this goes. Yes, and I, I didn't get quite done up because, well, we're hiking. And I yes. do makeup, but we're hiking. I don't do earrings usually either, but head covering, well, you got sparkly tonight because but sparkly. who hasn't necessarily taken a little uh, flask with them when they're on a hike? Necessity. <laughs> mm. How is it? It's good? Okay, I'll have to try some later. It passes. Yes, it oh, passes. Ooh, it's, it finishes very nicely. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to work our way west to east. Um, yes. This is all United States tonight. So but we will end in Virginia like we always do. Yes. So, uh, so uh, not unlike the last couple of weeks where we uh, have gone ahead and we've taken some uh, trips uh, overseas, yeah. uh, we... Uh, These are all U.S. hikes. Um, yeah. We haven't gone over any big ponds. I didn't do any of the Hawaii ones this time, but that'll be another one. Yes. And there's some Alaska ones, too. Yes. So. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I have a feeling we're going to be doing this for at least a few more weeks. But next next week, we'll be going across the pond. Yes. Yep. Both but, sides. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that at the end of the show. Yep. And just and just in case you're, y'all are wondering, we've been talking amongst ourselves. Even once we do manage to go ahead and get back mm-hmm. out to um, uh, you know hit the road and do the tours outside again, uh, we... Uh, uh, we have decided that we will at least be doing this at, at least once a month. Once a Ma- month, yeah. Maybe a couple times a month. We'll so, have to see what the schedule allows with yes. the reopening and, and what, what we when got. I go back to my other job as well as doing yeah. this. Yeah, so we will not stop this cold turkey. We have enjoyed doing this with you. <laughs> We've enjoyed uh, being able to share these moments with you. So we will keep doing the Facebook Live stuff even yeah. after this 
whole mess comes to an end, whenever that is. Yeah, and it does allow me to play with material that's outside of the state, which we can't always talk about unless it's like on one of our special dinner nights or pub nights. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where I like being able to explore other places because that's one of the things Chris and I like to do is when we go traveling, we like to go to haunted locations mm -hmm. and we like to hear those stories and the, the, the folklore. And we, I was actually talking on um, several of the different Virginia paranormal pages of where would we all go as soon as um, we're able to go somewhere and what would we go investigate. And I'm like, some of these hikes are awesome. I, I'll go to California. I'll go to Oregon. <laughs> I'll go to Montana and go to some of these other places. I have an entire book on national parks written by a former ranger and their stories. Now I will tell you, national parks don't like to talk about their ghosts. <laughs> But we're going to do some of that anyway. But we're going to do some of that anyway. So, I mean, she she was a former ranger and had trouble pulling some of these stories out of them. So it's kind of like UFOs. They don't like to talk about them. Um, so same thing with paranormal. They don't like to talk about them. Yes. Uh, but other ones are uh, state parks, um, local city parks that I've found that uh, are hikes, and they all have fascinating stories. So we're going to start in California. Yes, yeah, sort of, yeah. And I'm west, gonna, west to east. Yes, I'm going to let Chris tell these two first. Um, the first one is one I want to go to. Um, I've been in L.A., but I have not gone up to the Hollywood sign. Uh, and this is iconic. Everybody can knows what it looks like. If you've seen the uh, movie Rock of Ages, you've seen what the backside is modeled to look like. That wasn't the real sign. That was one they made. Um, but it does show you kind of the fenced area that you can that used to be there, and then there's another fenced area that we're going to be talking about mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So, but real quick, before we even get into that, just, just real quick, overall, talking about, you know, what what could really provoke these kinds of stories? What mm -hmm. makes a haunted hike? You know, mostly, most of the time you think of a hike, you're thinking about walking through the forest, nice and quiet, nice and isolated, something in theory that you could do now and do your social distancing. I know people who have gone out on hikes because yeah. they just need to get out. Yes, and don't blame them at all. We went for a yeah. long walk this evening. We did. But there's something about it, particularly once the sun starts to go down. If you're somebody that uh, goes out and actually goes camping in the woods or something mm -hmm. like that, you Which might do. you might have had you know this type of experience where you know the full moon is rising and the mist is starting to settle heavily across the forest floor, and you're walking along a path shaded by overgrown tree limbs twigs snapping beneath each of your steps. Every hair starts to stand on end and your heartbeat quickens. There's not necessarily anything definitive around you. You just have a feeling. And then all of a sudden, off to the right, you hear something crash in the woods around you. And then you hear some footsteps. Or what sounds like footsteps? Maybe it's just a deer. Hard to say. You can't Small quite animal. see. Squirrel. Encounters like this occur around you every day, or occur around people every day. And it's hard to, for people to judge. Is it necessarily something paranormal, or is it something, you know, else. something is else? It an is it an animal? Something paranormal? But some of the stories we're going to share with you tonight, starting with in California, uh, these come from sightings of people actually seeing some things. Not mm -hmm. just hearing something crashing in the woods, but seeing something around them. So as Beth mentioned, uh, California in particular is known for its hiking trails, and as a matter of fact, it's also unfortunately known for having the tendency for hikers to disappear every year without a trace, never to be heard from or ever found. Nobody not knows where they went or we have very little information on exactly what might have hap happened to them. So and the first it, rule, hike with a buddy. Yes. Several if you can. <laughs> now, in most cases, we know that they were not alone in the end. Strange things happen in the woods and desert deserts of California all the time. Not all of them are easily explained by science, and most will likely never be explained at all. So, are you one of the many who might dare to go ahead and tr explore one of these popular sites, or maybe a little too superstitious to risk it? And starting, as Beth said, we are going to start with one of the most iconic of all. This is going to be... Uh, talking about the Hollywood sign by Griffith Park, just out you now, you know, on the outskirts of LA. Now, there's actually three hikes that take you up there. Um, so there's a an easy, a medium, and a hard. Uh, so the easiest is known as the Mount Mount Hollywood Trail. This is a six and a half mile round trip loop. Um, it has an elevation of about 500 feet. 
This moderate trail is also six and a half miles round trip, um, and it has an elevation of a thousand feet, and that is the Canyon Drive Trail. I'm reading my notes here because I have all the different hiking notes here. <laughs> and the uh, most difficult trail is the Cahoo, uh, Cahunga? Cahunga Peak, Peak Hike. Um, not Calabaga, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> Cahunga Peak Hike. It's a six mile round trip with some very steep climbs. So depending on what your level is, depends on which climb you want to take to get up there. Um, but you want to always start at Griffith Park itself because that is actually haunted. So <laughs> Yes, Griffith Park is haunted. It's a, known actually kind of a little funny. It's known for having a haunted picnic table. Yes. And now the story behind it is kind of tragic. It's not like our, our haunted picnickers here at Capitol Square. Let's yeah. just say that. Yeah, <laughs> so if you go find Table 29, now, you can find pictures of this online. I have to admit, I don't know if it's still like this today, if they've left it there for the sake of nostalgia or whatever you might want to call it. <laughs> but table number 29 is rumored to be haunted by a pair of frisky lovers who were getting busy on the table when a tree limb fell from a nearby tree and crushed them. Don't do it in the park, guys. <laughs> now... The table, <laughs> there's, there's pictures online of this table sitting in ruins today, and it has become a very popular draw for paranormal enthusiasts, many of whom leave gifts that look like something straight out of the Blair, Blair Witch Project. Yeah. It's a very kind of creepy looking place, for sure. And now, the paranormal activity that's associated with it, well... You can guess if they were frisky. You can kind you of use your imagination what you might hear around there if you kind of catch my drift. Um, so, yeah, haunted picnic table number 29 in, in Griffith, Griffith Park. Park. So that's where you should start your, your hike. Um, but then hop on one of those three trails, whichever one is the best one for you, and uh, head up to the sign. Now, the sign is actually haunted by an actress known as Peg and Switzel. Uh, she actually jumped from the letter H, supposedly committing suicide, uh, again, supposedly. This happened in 1932, and it was a Friday the 13th. It was a little questionable. Yeah. She was only 24 years old at the yeah. time, and uh, hikers along the trail of the park have not only seen a woman who matches and whistles appearance, and in clothing from that era, but also her spirit falling from the letter H disappearing before reaching the rugged terrain of this famous hill. Many have reported seeing her ghostly figure in the mist, and others report the scent of flowers in the area, not necessarily those that are native to the area. Yeah, it's actually gardenias, which was the perfume that Peg favored. Yes. Uh, and there are no gardenias that grow in this area. Yeah. And, it, you know, it does have, uh, so people have reported having encounters with this spectral figure. And also, you know, the place does just kind of have an eer general eerie feel mm -hmm. feeling about it. It's, yeah. a, it's been like this, um, you know, the Hollywood sign's been up there for, gosh, what, this got to be, this is 1932. So when was it first constructed? I'd have to look that up. Mm. But, it's, but it's been there for quite some time. That makes time. it 88 years old at least right now. She's, I don't think she's the only death out there either, yeah. but she's the most famous. Now, yeah, and you, she's not the only one, and that does kind of lead into, you can't to this, today, you cannot go and you cannot um, hike right up to the... Uh, the sign anymore, right. because so many people have climbed it accidentally following. Yes. Um, the park rangers are tired of this. So there's a fence around it, so you can't walk right up to it. You can't um, be right behind it like you uh, saw in the movie Rock of Ages. Yeah. Uh, but there used to be a platform back there that you could actually look over L.A. Um, but you can see it. You can uh, take pictures of it. You can't really get around the front because it's very steep, very rocky, very dangerous terrain. But you can get to an overlook that's further up. The Hugh Hefner Overlook. Yes. yes, the man has an overlook right up behind the Hollywood <laughs> sign named after him. Because it's Hugh. <laughs> he is a very accomplished man. Yes. And, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, now, 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 unlike some uh, Hollywood, um, you know, razzle-dazzle, if you will, there actually does seem to be some credence to this tale. This isn't something that was just made up uh, from, you know, as is the nature of Hollywood. It's mm -hmm. not some fantastic tale. Because many of the tales that have come from the sign and many of these sightings have actually been reported by park rangers, rangers themselves. Yeah. You know, people that live and work in the area, but they're definitely not associated with Hollywood proper, if you will. Yeah. They're not people who would tell tales or embellish them. Yes. Now, 
Uh, you can't legally visit the park at night, but only till about 10.30. Mm -hmm. um, because it is cool to see the sign at yeah. night. It's all lit up. It's really cool. There's an observatory. One of our guides actually was at the observatory when mm -hmm. she was on Jeopardy. Yes. <laughs> um, so she got to see the sign from the observatory. She didn't go all the way up, though. Uh, she did tell me that she would like to. Yeah, and, uh, but yeah, and so, but do make note, just if you do go up there later in the evening or if you're walking out and about, do watch out for the coyotes. They are, uh, they are up there in the prevalent in that area. So. All right, so our next stop. Oh, well, you missed uh, the bonus. Oh, the beach. Uh, the okay. beach. Yeah, you, you're, you're skipping about again, dear. I am. I'm sorry. It's because I don't have these on my notes. Yes. So <laughs> now this is not the only location. There, there is a bonus not associated with the hike uh, that Peg is also thought to haunt another area as well. If you go and stop by the Beechwood Cafe, which is, uh, you know, it's now no longer there today. It is now the um, uh, Hollywood Land, or was, excuse me, the Hollywood Land Drugstore. Uh, she visited this area before taking her fatal tumble off of the sign, and patrons have reported seeing her retrace her steps through Beechwood Village from inside the cafe. So if you want to, you can go to the cafe, grab a snack, and settle in by the window and keep an eye out. You've got until closing time, which is 9 p.m., to possibly catch a glimpse of her. So, yes, that is the story of Peg and the Hollywood sign out in California. And she's not the only... There's been lots of rumors of various paranormal activity associated with the trail. It's just a spooky kind of thing. It's a, you got this big park with this huge sign overlooking the city mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a you talk about a very very tight mashup of cosmopolitan and wilderness, wilderness. that literally runs right into each other yeah it's sitting right on top of each other and, and multiple layers mm -hmm. and it's just kind of something that drives you know kind of a very unique energy yeah. to it it makes for a very can make for a very spooky atmosphere and so. as one who has driven from new mexico to la you literally go through miles and miles and miles of upon miles of desert and barrenness and then all of a sudden you are wham on the LA freeway coming in and it's there it just opens up into this huge bowl of metropolitan from nothing <laughs> and I'm like oh hello <laughs> yes. yep. and real quick hey we got our guide Allison hey, on with us tonight so yes, hi, he did shave. I did shave I he got itchy <laughs> I got itchy I got bored what else am I gonna do right now I sit on the couch, I work, I go out for a walk every once in a while. He lets the cat assist him. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I decided it was just time for it to go. So yeah. no more no more beard. But yeah. So anyways. Uh, so we're gonna hop over to Altadena, um, California. Yep, still sticking around the uh, the the Golden State. Yes, and so this area is actually known as the Haunted Forest. You might know it by a historical name, which is the Cobb Estate. Yeah, so it does have that you know, it has rightfully earned that very, you know, cliche moniker, the Haunted Forest. It does have that uh, that kind of uh, reputation to it. Um, and so you can uh, walk through this Haunted Forest to reach the San Merrill Trail uh, to Echo Mountain in Altadena. But you might know better by the Cobb Estate, designated, as its sign says, as a quiet refuge for people and wildlife forever that may have extended into the afterlife. Given the stories of spectral sightings and weird noises at the vacant estate in the mid-1950s... Excuse me. <laughs> My beer is talking a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, now owned by the U.S. Forest Service, the estate is said to be haunted. The wildlife-rich acreage it sits on makes for good walking as well. It is about a one-and-a-half-mile hike, and it is okay to take your leashed dogs there. So it's a fairly short hike, fairly, you know, yep. you know, fairly kind of low-key, pet-friendly... Um, and so to get there, you just need to go and you drive out Lake Avenue to uh, uh, Altadena uh, and you look for a place to park. It's all street parking. Yes, all street parking in this area. And it's it's not, there's no big parking lot. No. It, it's, it's really, like, it's kind of tucked back into a residential neighborhood. It is. So you want to be in the corner of Lake Avenue and East Loma Alta Drive. That's where the park starts. And you'll see the big gates for the park because this used to be an estate. There used mm -hmm. to be a proper home there. Uh, and so uh, you go ahead and you walk, you park. You find a place to get in at the gate, mm -hmm. which you can legally do, mind you. Yep. Uh, walk up this paved asphalt road along a line of tall, thin trees. And as you new, near the ruins of the estate, you'll notice that there's kind of a little changeover in the foliage. Mm -hmm. uh, you got your classic eucalyptus and oak in the area, but then, of course, uh, have it 
with it having been in the state at one point in time. You had other flora and fauna yes. brought in, so you got including cacti. Not cactus, my favorite thing. Yeah, cactus, palm tree, cactus. That's cactus and I on my hands. Lots of. Yeah, that, no. that's another. That's <laughs> another story. But anyways, so you'll walk past the ruins of the estate and you'll turn up onto a wide path and continue uphill. Uh, you'll actually pass a working water fountain that was installed as part of the park infrastructure and uh, you'll uh, go under a large oak tree. Uh, you'll stop where the path ends and you'll be beside a covered reservoir and above a waterfall that you can hear down to the canyon below. As you come back down along the hillside you'll be uh, you'll see the ro uh, road, road in front of the ruins and if you continue straight down you'll eventually reach a T-intersection which this is where you meet the San Merrill Trail and that will begin the long climb to Mount Low if you're inclined to take a much more uh, kind of intense, lengthy. lengthy, intensive hike. But that is not where the ghost stories reside. No, they the are right around the estate itself and the ruins that are now there because the estate no longer stands. Yes. It's just the park now. Now, it, it doesn't even go back that far, the property. No. The, uh, the estate was originally built by, as you might guess, the Cobb estate was built by a man named Charles Cobb. He was a lumber magnate in the area, and his wife, Carrie, together, they built an Altadena mansion in 1918. So it only goes back 102 years to when it was first developed in this area. Mm -hmm. And it was a Spanish-style mansion. Yep. And uh, now, there's no real tragic story associated with the Cobbs. Um, mm -hmm. They both they both lived there until the day they died. Um, uh, Mr. Cobb being the last one, he passed away in 1939. At which point, the ownership transferred to the Pasadena Masons Lodge per Cobb's will. No ghost stories at this point. Then the Masons sold the property to the Sisters of Saint Joseph, a, uh, a, a collection of nuns, to be used as a retreat. Still, no ghost stories. It wasn't until 1956 when. The Marx Brothers, yes, those Marx Brothers, purchased the property, and that's when the strange noises and eerie lights started. For decades, the Spanish-themed estate survived brush fires, but it ultimately fell into disrepair under the ownership of the Marx Brothers. I think it had been on its way there for a while. Yeah, and they're known for partying, not upkeeping. Yeah, so, so it only lasted under their ownership for a few short years until the home was torn down in 1959. So the the home only stood there for just about forty one years. Yeah, and, you know, rather short life for the uh, for the property itself. Over the subsequent years, reports of spirited activities it continued, earning the area the moniker of the haunted forest. The land narrowly avoided becoming a cemetery as neighbors surrounding the property protested. They figured that the only thing worse than living in a neighborhood by a haunted forest that would be to live in a neighborhood by a haunted forest with a cemetery in it. So they protested that. Double wham bam, no thank you, man. Yes. And instead, in 1971, the property became a public park operated by the U.S. Forest Service. All right, so as you walk through the, um, the forest and the, the estate area, again, beware of the ruins because they can trip you and all those types of things. Um, but you might stop, start to hear things that are weird in the middle of the night. It could be teenagers. It could be night hikers. You can actually go hiking through this in the evening. Um, but it's also possibly one of the Marx Brothers walking the old estate. Uh, they also uh, say that there is a notoriously violent history in this forest, and that includes home to murders, to a dumping ground for human remains, and also historical lynchings and mysterious witchcraft. So it might not just be the Marx Brothers who are on the grounds. It could be some of the other things that were nefarious on these grounds as well that are maybe still going on. Uh, specifically, they report psychic phenomena, strange figures uh, appearing to hang from trees and pressing the feeling of being stopped. Are we... Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, I'm good. Sorry, everybody, I got a little close to y'all there. But there's also another fun little bonus material here. If you go over to Loma Alta Drive, at the northeast perimeter of the Rubio Wash Debris Basin, um, you will get to the Altadena Haunted Gravity Hill. And I actually want to go try this. Start at the bottom of the hill, put your car in neutral, and experience as your car defies gravity by rolling uphill. Supposedly, it's the spirits dragging you to the similar demise as theirs, for extra spoots, sprinkle baby powder on your hood of your car before you start and inspect it afterwards for handprints and fingers. Want to go, honey? Oh, yeah. Go buy some baby powder. I'm game. <laughs> so, yeah, um, uh, 
any of our, our paranormal groups, I say we need to take a road trip out to California. All right, so now we're going to move to Montana. Um, and this one actually deals with an old toll road that used to run through, but it's now known as the French Woman's Road. And this is also uh, crossing McDonald's, or it's known as McDonald's Pass, crossing the Continental Divide. Uh, and it's in Helena National Forest in Montana, so another national park. Um, this one does have a tragic ending, and I'm actually going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, the, the hike itself is 3,100 miles for the Continental Divide Trail that this crosses, and it's just outside of Helena. Uh, when you're uh, crossing over, that's when you want to hit the French Woman's Trail. You will follow the road to take you to where a cabin once stood. A weekend warrior can actually do six miles north from the trailhead off of US-12 through a canopy of lodgepole pines, past old mines to Priest Pass, and you'll have covered the section that has the French woman's cabin and uh, the old toll area. Excuse me. Uh oh. Sorry, we were out walking and Napoleon got to me. All right, so here's our story of the French woman. The young farmhand smelled it before he saw it, the metallic odor wafting through the open door and tickling his nostrils. It was a sad day uh, in August of 1868. The farmhand, or some versions of the story say pa uh, passing by travelers, dismounted his horse and peered through the doorway to the rustic suite. And there, beneath the bed of burgundy linens and a mahogany table set for two, was the proprietor's wife, a thirty-something beauty with jet black hair laying face down in a pool of her own blood. This was Madame Guillaume, and she was nearly decapitated from a bullet to her skull. Her husband, Constant, was the suspect, of course, but the case was never solved. So, Madame Guillot operated the nearby toll road for her husband. Uh, he had actually built the pass, which was 6,312-foot McDonough Pass in the mid-1860s, and it made traveler, traveling easier between Helena and Deer Lodge Valley, which was the young Montana's uh, territory at that point in time. They didn't have the funds as a territory to make these roads, so they allowed people to do it in charge tolls. Uh, in addition to collecting the tolls, Madame was also the hostess of a nearby hostel where the travelers, weary travelers, could stay for the evening and also get a good meal. Uh, to do uh, a night there and ha have your meals included it was $3, and many uh, travelers actually would press on beyond the limits of their capabilities just be to be able to stay at this hostel. She was a wonderful hostess, a great cook, apparently, uh, and there were, at times, recorded over 30 people in the dormitories sleeping basically as close as you could possibly get, and sometimes on the floors, just to enjoy her hospitality. <laughs> so she was very popular as a hostess. You wouldn't know anything about that. No, I'd make a good Madame Guillaume just without the decapitation, please. Her, her, her hospitality helped reel me in. <laughs> I cooked an Easter dinner. Another story for another day. Yes. <laughs> um, now, uh, on any given night, as I mentioned, there could be more than 30 people here. Uh, people would stop early. People would push on hard to get there to be able to stop. Now, Madame had two secrets. First, her husband was very abusive. Uh, she would dread going home in the evening because her husband had been working on a nearby hay field. As soon as he went home from the hay field, he would start hitting the bottle. And as soon as she got home, he would start hitting Nice timing. <laughs> I'll just set that bottle down. <laughs> um, so she was beaten quite a bit by him, and she was starting to make plans to leave. But to leave, she needed money. So she started skimming off of the top of the tolls and off of the rentals at the hostel. Uh, and she had saved close to, was it 6000 Yeah. Six thousand uh, dollars worth of gold, and she was actually planning to leave that uh, later that fall to get out and go back to France and leave her husband forever. That's a lot of money back then. That was a ton of money back then. Um, unfortunately, that money had been taken the night that she was killed. And nobody knows where it went to. If her husband ever took it, they never saw it. Um, so we don't know. The killer was never found, never caught. Unfortunately, poor Madame has been tied to this property ever since. Um, years following her unsolved murder, she was spotted lurking amid the lodgepole uh, pines uh, that pass along the Continental Divide, among the low-hanging timbers, uh, and uh, within the cottage while it still stood. They were, uh, later on, however, once the cottage was gone, 
and this became a car road. Uh, people actually started reporting picking up a um, beauty in her 30s with long jet black hair uh, who was hitchhiking on the side of the road. So that kind of goes back to our one of our prior storytelling events. Yes. Like, Beware the woman hitchhiker. <laughs> <laughs> um, their descriptions vary slightly, but it always includes the jet black hair um, and that she was a beauty. Uh, the driver, uh, actually, first story that came out of this, a driver once stopped near the white highways cross for a cigarette, and when he returned to his car, he found the woman sitting in his back seat, and she asked him for a ride to Helena. He agreed, but on the way there, she vanished out of the back of his car, right around where the cabin once was. Uh, the cross apparently marks the site of another car accident that killed two teenagers on their way to a dance in Helena. That sounds familiar as well. <laughs> um, so, you might go hiking out there. You might see Madame. Uh, if you do, give her a ride if she asks for one. Mm. The poor woman is still trying to get out of there. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I'm just imagining what you might look like with jet black hair. I think you could pull it off. She could pull it off. Going back to my blonde. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next one I've actually been to. Chris is not, so we need to get him there. Um, and this yes. is uh, Mammoth Cave. Yes. Uh, if you have not been to Mammoth Cave, it is awesome. So, and there are a ton of trails and tours to take through there. Um, I went when I was seventh grade. It's been a while. It's been a while. Um, I wanted to go through the one that actually makes you climb through the caves and come out all muddy and yucky and wonderful. And my mom wouldn't do that one, so we didn't. But I will have to go back and do some of these. I, mm. I do recall some of these sites that are on here. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I have pictures anywhere. Well, <laughs> anyways, there are many multiple hikes through Mammoth Cave, and uh, tours are available, uh, and they do change from year to year. I mean, so the, you always have to check. Yeah, the the caves have miles and miles and miles of trails in them. It's a very it's four hundred mile plus yeah. that they have discovered so far. Hence it's, the name Mammoth Cave. Yeah, it is huge. So make sure you, uh, if you want to go ahead and find one of these haunted sites, you need to make sure that you sign up for one of the tours that is slated to pass the tuberculosis huts. Because uh, that's where you want to stick tuberculosis patients. Yeah. In a cave. Yeah. It, <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. So, <laughs> uh, but options, uh, some of the options that we know about, or from at least from the past, uh, options include the Three Mile Violet City lantern tour mm -hmm. where you carry a kerosene lantern like tourists did is uh, 150 years ago and then the shorter one mile gothic avenue tour uh, reservations are required for these so uh, make sure that if you want to go ahead and do this that you do your research and sign up for it in advance and after your tour you can also hike the half a mile heritage trail from mammoth cave hotel which passes the old guides cemetery where tuberculosis patients and former slave guides are buried. So both locations are haunted, and there's actually three caves in this area. Mammoth is just the biggest one, and the other two are haunted, but we're going to do those another day. Yes. Um, so, but. <laughs> so now, going back a, a long ways, we're talking all the way 1800s, yeah. uh, scientists were working in there, and they removed what uh, they knew to be a timber that had been in there for 30 years from the old mine in Mammoth Cave, and they discovered that the planks had not even begun to rot. They were just like the day they, they had been put in. And at least one man noticed. Dr. John Krogan began monitoring local journals and accounts from the area and saw a pattern. Dead bats showed no sign of decay. Centuries old human corpses even remained perfectly intact and inside the cave. And you might be cave. going, human corpses what? Um, when the Native Americans lived in this area, they actually used this as a burial ground because they thought the cave would um, help their dead get to the afterlife faster by putting them deeper into the ground. Uh, so there are bodies that are still being discovered there today. They're not always very loud about it when they find one. Um, but yeah, this was used as a burial site for, for hundreds of years by the Native Americans yeah. before we came in and took it over. <laughs> yeah. So. Awkward. Awkward. Yes. Awkward yeah. pause. Yes. So back to Dr. Just Krogan. <laughs> so Dr. Krogan was convinced that the air in Mammoth Cave 
held inexplicable healing powers, and Dr. Corgan purchased the hollow outright, including slaves who worked as tour guides, for $10,000 in 1839. Yes, they actually had slaves that, you know, they, they weren't... They, People went to go tour this, and yes. these slaves were guides, and they had explored it and found a lot of the passages. Uh, we'll actually get back to one in particular who uh, was the most famous one. Um, not, not, the, not the typical... Uh, uh, quote unquote profession that you imagine somebody um, putting a slave to work on, but this was uh, yeah. kind of a well, unique case. It's also a carryover from when they were mining saltpeter in here during the War of eighteen twelve. Um, so this this cave has had multiple multiple lives. Now, now mm -hmm. Dr. Krogan, he wasn't necessarily most interested, obviously, in the tours of the caves, although those, those did, continue. did continue. Yeah. Uh, he did, within the next few years, he managed to go ahead and set up a subterranean sanitarium. So, yes, he basically set up some sort of hospital down in Mammoth Cave. And 15 or 16 tuberculosis patients lived among 11 crude huts marinating in the cave's con constant air temperature of 54 degrees Fahrenheit. They reported improved health, inspiring the doctor to draw plans for a massive underground hotel, which guests were bound to visit when news of the cave's magical air spread across the country. And this was the <clears> time <throat> of magical water, magical air. Everybody is suffering from tuberculosis and consumption at this point in time, so they're all looking for some type of quick fix. If this works, great. What it did, part of it slowed down. The advance of tuberculosis, but it didn't get rid of it, and then it actually ended up wrecking the people's lungs, so that when they did get back up um, to normal air, it just progressed it that much faster. Yeah, unfortunately. So yeah, the the underground hotel never came to pass. Two of the patients actually passed away within the first year of living down there. Five more passed away in 1840, and the dank air actually ravaged their lungs. The surviving patients were brought up to the surface, and they all succumbed to consumption the way, uh, the normal way, way above ground. And in 1849, Dr. Krogan himself died of the disease. Yeah. <clears throat> so yet, yeah, the uh, this uh, the sanatorium was not the oldest application of the case. History is, uh, as Beth mentioned, 4,000 years prior, it had been used as a burial ground by Native Americans, and uh, it had also been a saltpeter mine. And then this uh, army of slaves uh, had been used to mine the cave's innards. And when uh, they went ahead and they kind of petered off with mm -hmm. the... Um, with the saltpeter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, Unintended pun, but yeah, <laughs> I went there, okay. Uh, they went ahead and the slaves stuck around and they basically, uh, many of them became um, the, tour guides. The guides. Again, they were property, <clears throat> unfortunately, at this point in time. So they were bound to whoever owned the cave. And thus sold when the cave was sold to Dr. Grogan. Um... Now, the most famous one was Stephen Bishop, and uh, he's actually responsible for finding many of the cave's features and more than 20 miles of passageways. Uh, and he's the one who actually found the blind albino fish swimming in the underground Echo River, which are really cool. I have seen those. <laughs> um, and he has, was known for his athletic ability. Uh, his calm demeanor was legendary. He could get you through any sort of crisis without a problem. Uh, he actually did earn his um, his freedom eventually as a guide. Unfortunately, he died about a year after he earned his freedom. Uh, but he could converse about the cave's features as well as any professor at a college. Uh, he was that eloquent in how he described things and how he was able to talk to the guests. Uh, so he was legendary. Uh, he was actually buried up in the guide's cemetery, so you can go and see him, uh, his grave up there today. Now, um, as we mentioned, the tours continued while the sanitarium was going on, and they actually went right by the sanitarium so they could gawk at these patients uh, while Dr. Krogan had them down there. Yeah, kind of a, a, a very creepy, macabre thing in and of itself because they were down there, they were all done up and, you know, had, were wearing, like, their hospital gowns, mm -hmm. um, and they were known for their hacking and coughing, and it would reverberate through the dark caverns down there so and you might think really people would do this well if you go back to um the 1920s and 30s i think it was when the ventilators were just coming out as a way to save infants they actually had a display at coney island and this was a way to 
educate people about these ventilators and get them passed through the medical system so that they could become available at all the hospitals. So people would see this as a sideshow, a medical sideshow, and they would go to it uh, up until at least the 1940s and 50s, I think, mm -hmm. is when the last one happened. So. And it, I mean, it was something, that it, uh, I think, yeah, the 50s, maybe even into the 60s, that um, they were kind of uh, one of those, those classic, you know, it, it's not a very eloquent term, but it was kind of a freak show type. Yeah, it was a um, carnival sideshow. Kind of carnival sideshow. Island. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they would go ahead. They would see these patients down mm -hmm. there. They would also walk past this uh, rock formation, which was known as Corpse Rock, because anybody that died down in the cavern, that's where they would be taken and kind of laid yeah. out before being, you know, finally removed from the cavern. It's also it's worth noting that around. Uh, corpse rock people have noted hearing the sounds of coughing in the area now maybe it's just sounds reverberating from other parts of the cavern yeah because or... it's not the quietest thing when you're taking a, a tour in there uh, most people do actually try to get quiet when they're by this section to see if they can hear anything but if there's another tour group coming you will hear them coming through the caves behind you so yes. it's not always easy to get that quiet that you need to try mm -hmm. to hear the hacking and the coughing yes now, amongst the other paranormal activity, we're actually circle back um, to Stephen himself, and park rangers and visitors alike report actually seeing Stephen and other uh, slave guides returning to the cave from time to time. Uh, perhaps they are checking up on the current guides to make sure that they are doing their job properly. They had standards. They had high standards, and if you're not doing your job, you don't know if somebody might be coming in and critiquing you. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, on one of the Violet City tours, park rangers give the visitors an idea of what it's like to visit the caves before light bulbs and flashlights. One ranger turns off the electric lights, while the other ranger speaks to the group by the light of an old oil lantern. Many guides have, experience, have experiences during these blackouts. They have been shoved playfully by an unseen force. They have heard footsteps and turned to see no one there. They have been grabbed or touched in the darkness when there are no other people nearby. During, an, during one blackout, guide Larry Purcell noticed an African-American family standing behind the rest of the group. Purcell was a bit surprised because he hadn't noticed them on the tour prior to this. The father wore a white Panama hat and watched the other ranger talk with rapt attention. When Purcell turned the lights back on, the family was nowhere to be seen. The room they were in is also known as the Methodist Church because miners once held religious services there. During those days, if an African American guide and his family attended the services, they would have to stand a distance from the white miners. So they think that it might actually be one of those families standing mm -hmm. back uh, behind the tourists that are still, ling uh, still coming through the cavern to this day. So another occasion, uh, a couple of uh, park guys, and they always go in pairs, one in the front, one in the back. Uh, again, safety reasons and to turn on and off lights in various places. Uh, Mammoth Cave, uh, they were going through the Mammoth Cave and ended up in the chief city room when a woman on the uh, tour pointed up and said, Who's up there among those rocks? The guides looked and saw a man holding a lantern on the formation known as Sacrifice Rock. The man wore a long sleeve shirt and an old drooping style hat like those worn by the slave guides. Though the man could be seen from different angles, the park guides decided, decided, it was an image created by a series of shadows. I guess they didn't care that maybe one of the former guides was watching them on their tour. Um, after a failed sanitarium, a mammoth cave continued to exchange hands and it adopted new uses. Some, like the Surfside attraction where guests could explore the snake-like passages, others not so much like a public viewing area where guests could see the corpse of a man who perished in the depths displayed in a glass top coffin. We'll tell that story another day. <laughs> uh, but it is, as I said, known to be the largest cave network over 400 miles of known passageways and is a national park to this day. It became one in 1941, 90 years after Dr. Grogan, Krogan had passed and it was designated and protected. Now the Heritage Walk is, uh, as we said, a half mile and you catch it uh, right by the, the Mammoth Cave uh, Hotel and it heads you up to the Old Guide Cemetery. Uh, it's home to the patients who died in the cave as well as the former slave guides and one afternoon two employees were hiking the trail near the footbridge behind the hotel 
when they were started to see a pair of legs with no body attached walking down <laughs> towards them. <clears throat> I'd be out of there. Uh, though disembodied legs were seen at mid-afternoon, the employee blamed her uncanny vision on the shadows. As I mentioned, the, the park employees, the rangers, they don't like to talk about the ghostly activities that they have seen, that they have witnessed. Um, sometimes they are told they're not allowed to talk about it. So they will say, oh, it was just a trip in the shadows. Oh, uh, my vision was off. There was some glare. There was something along those lines. So there will be excuses made for things when you hear get any of these stories mm -hmm. so did have a question oh what was the um, question it's actually related back to the um the church down mm -hmm. there uh why was it methodist do we know was it just a prominent um they explained that on the tour but i do not remember i'd have to go back and look research yeah research, research. i'll just have to I, I they might explain it on their website i'd have to go back and look yeah because i think they have a list of the rooms the most popular rooms so. so, best answer we got is that it seems like it's probably it was probably the prominent sect yeah. at the time, and probably the minister who chose to come down it was a Methodist minister. So, good question. Yeah, it was a very good question. As I said, I, I think they explained it on the tour, but <laughs> it's been years. They say it's all it's all good. <laughs> Patrick says it's all good. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was a lot younger then. <laughs> So we're going to stay kind of in that same general region, but we are going to hop over a state. Yeah. We are going to go to Tennessee mm -hmm. and uh, the Ghost House Trail at Big Ridge State Park. Yes. Now this is located in a well, Big Ridge State Park near Maynardsville, Tennessee. And the Ghost House Trail, also called the Ghost Loop Trail, is a 1.2 mile loop trail starting at the Grist Mill Trailhead and quickly turning north. Uh, onto the trail. The trail will take you past the Hutchinson Family Farm in Norton Cemetery. It's an easy flat hike, but it is a haunted one. And dogs do go on this one. Just beware your dog may sense something along the way. That's happened to quite a few hikers who have taken their dogs along that, that hike. Now, when you walk through Big Ridge State Park, it's easy to see why the pioneers of the 19th century decided to settle in the area. In the mid-1800s, the area was noted for its old-growth hardwoods, wild flower-covered meadows, and limestone hollows. Amongst the natural features were a scattering of homesteads. Unfortunately, families started leaving the area one by one. Some say it was due to the ghostly activity. By the late 1800s, one prominent family remained in the area, the Hutchinson family had confidence in the woods, but even this would not save them from the strange occurrences that characterized the area. Now, young Mary Hutchinson, unfortunately, had fallen ill with tuberculosis, thus the link between the two. I like my links, my arcs. <laughs> uh, the legend goes that the family and friends were actually walking through the woods uh, one evening on their way to visit Mary. It was a particularly dark night, and as they were walking, they heard the sound of a very agitated hound dog barking and howling. Thinking it was Mary's dog had gotten out and loose, they looked around using the light from their lantern, searching for this dog. They could not find it. They could not see it anywhere. And it was actually during their search for the dog that Mary ended up passing away. Uh, this was the first of many sightings of the hounds at the Hunterton uh, homestead. The patriarch of the Hutchinson family, Mastison, uh, was driven mad by the despair over his daughter's death. Uh, he refused to leave the area and died in 1910. It's actually unknown if it was due to natural causes or maybe the uh, phantom dog also paid him a visit and he passed away as well. There are many actually good stories of um, hound dogs being uh, the forebearers of death or the harbingers of death. So we, we're not quite sure if this dog actually falls into that. Um, story, or if it really was Mary's dog that got lost and was grieving because he knew his mistress had passed away. So the house in these woods is so spooky that they named the trail after it. Many hikers report hearing Mary as they pass by the homestead ruins. Hikers also report encountering the sound of a phantom dog roaming in the woods to this day, hearing it panting, but never seeing it. One hiker was with his German shepherd on the trail, and the German shepherd stopped and refused to go near the ruins of the homestead. The shepherd set his feet and bared his teeth. The owner scanned the area, but saw nothing. Remember, dogs see on a different level than we do, and spirits are actually attracted to dogs uh, and other animals, so 
you might see something or your dog may see something mm -hmm. while you're out here. Now they also report seeing the spirit of Mastin, also his uh, said to haunt the ruins of his homestead. He's still restless following those who hike through the woods from the homestead to his grave site. He is said to photobomb you when you stop for a picture. The eerie trail winds past the cemetery where the family now rests. Many reported spotting inhabitants of the graves in the Norton Cemetery, which also appear in photographs standing behind their final resting places. So if you want to have a ghostly photobomb, go see Mastin. Yes. <laughs> yep. That's just down the road and over in Tennessee. Yep. So we're going to go north real quick. We're going to go up to New York. Yes, we are. Now this one, of all of them, this one really kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies the most because I, I've done a little research into the site since it was what it was. And what we're talking about is Letchworth Village Cemetery uh, in Cheesecote Mountain. Cheesecote, yeah. Cheesecote? Cheesecote. Cheesecote Mountain Town Park up in New York. Uh, this is, um, you this know, is this, not as long path. Yes. Now, you might be familiar with this because it's been on a couple of the paranormal um, TV Shows. shows. Uh, like Ghost Adventures visited there, mm -hmm. um, and they visited it because the, the, um, the, the village, it was a um, just a, a nice way of saying a um, sanitarium. sanitarium. So, yeah, it, it, it was opened with good intentions, but we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, the hike itself is uh, you can go to the Mount Ivy Park and Ride and you'll find a well-worn footpath on the west side of the Palisades Interstate Parkway via the underpass. Take it north in Cheesecote Mountain Town Park where you will meet the long path trail near Cheesecote Pond at mile 2.5. Reach the Letchworth Village Cemetery near mile 3.4. So this was the burial site for people who died at the, the sanitary. sanitarium. All right, so between the birch woods, mossy hollows, periodic long-range views, there are enough highlights of this 350-plus mile long path to refuel any starved New Yorker. So this is not too far from New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're not carefully looking, you can easily pass by the cemetery because literally it's just a grouping of metal T's with numbers printed on them. They're not true headstones. They're, they look more like a vegetable garden than a cemetery. Um, now before all the Catskill Mountain Parks and the state parks, Long Path actually threaded through this mountain area uh, and it was a tiny slice of metro wilderness for people escaping the city to come and walk through and, and just refresh themselves in nature. Uh, and then you actually end up getting to where the village is. Now the village today is abandoned. You can't go into the buildings unless you have permission. It's con it's considered trespassing. Uh, you can walk the grounds but not go into any of the buildings. Uh, but the village itself uh, ended up being a um, state institution for the segregation of epileptic and feeble-minded. It was the terminology they used at the time. <clears throat> yes, so, so 1911. It, yeah, <laughs> uh, it was uh, Fields, New York? Yes. Fields, New York. And it was supposed to be a more progressive solution for the developmentally disabled people than, say, an asylum. There is a distinction here. Uh, the idea was ripe. It had, was supposed to be a self-sustaining, self-contained village for patients and attendants, certainly seeming more productive than sentencing people to an almshouse. But things did devolve over time. Yeah. It just did not... You, yeah. It was set up so that they could work. Uh, and be a productive community and that's the idea behind it but unfortunately it it really didn't reach its potential it didn't reach what it was supposed to be uh, so you were actually divided into three categories and this again this is terminology of excuse the, time. the uh, excuse the modern political incorrectness but this was uh, the medical terminology so you were divided worst to least so the, the worst, worst to less worse yeah so the worst was defined as an idiot, then came an imbecile, and then came a moron. Uh, unfortunately, those were the medical terms of the time. Depending on what you were categorized as, depending on what your training was, and thus what your job ended up being. Yes, so um, you know, they would be assigned tasks like farming, cooking, sewing, cleaning, or even welding. Um, and it was a radical departure from the day's prescribed treatment for developmental illnesses. And if you can get past the cringe-worthy diagnoses, maybe it might have even actually been a good idea in theory. 
but reports from the 1930s quickly revealed that in practice it wasn't working the way it was supposed to. Letchworth Village housed 3,000 patients by the mid-1930s, and the place was simply overcrowded and underfunded. So if you have too many patients there, you're not going to be able to give them all jobs, you're not going to be able to clothe them, you're not going to be able to food feed them, you're not going to be able to house them sufficiently. And this is what Letchworth ended up coming into, and at this point the patients get neglected, yep. and then they get abused. It was in the 1940s that an expose came out and revealed that the treatment itself was neglectful. Photographs were published of patients unwashed and naked, and they were sleeping on the floor. In 1950, the first trial case of the polio vaccine was tested on the Letchworth Village children. It's worth noting that the vaccine would ultimately be developed into one of the ones that we use today, um, and that none of the children did experience adverse side effects, but... but in fact, they were used as lab rats. Yes. They were considered insignificant expendable. and expendable, and that was just wrong. By our standards today, that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. So this was a, you know, it was a pretty nasty and hellish atmosphere there, even though, I mean, it might have been founded with the best of intentions. It just was not working out well. Now you might think after the expose, why didn't they shut it down? The place didn't shut down until 1996. They didn't have anywhere to send people. No. I mean, they... And it took a, a huge change in the belief system. I mean, at the time that this place was founded, it was considered shameful to have a family member who was afflicted with one of these types of developmental diseases and um, debilitating diseases. I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher who taught inclusion for many, many, many years. These kids can do things. But to shut them away the way they did, that was the belief at the time, unfortunately. Um, thank God we have changed, and it took a huge shift to be able to say, no, this is not right. We shouldn't hide these people away. We should give them the best quality of life we can in society. And yeah. it wasn't until we got that shift that finally Letchworth got closed down. Yeah. But, yeah, before that, it was a truly you know, kind of horrible situation, which is compounded and truly driven home by the state of the cemetery itself. Mm -hmm. These metal stakes and the simple numbering system without any names or anything like that was intentional because nobody that sent their family members there wanted anybody to know down the line that they had family members there and that they passed away there and were buried there because it was such a shameful thing. I yeah. mean, that, they wanted it, the anonymity, 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 uh, whatever. Anonymity. Anonymity. It, I can't it, say that word ever. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, it did go that far. So it truly was kind of a, you know, it, and it's not just Letchworth. I mean, mm. there were, it, this is truly kind well, of the story of asylum the around the country. The Kennedys. Yes. Rose Kennedy, if you look at her story, oh my God, the stuff they did to her was horrendous. But it, it does show you what the belief was in the 1950s. Yep. In the 50s and 60s. I mean, yeah. So, uh, but patients continued to be victims of abuse and extreme neglect, and it was documented by ABC News in the 70s. Letchworth, you know, shut down 96, in 96. It has since fallen into ruin, and although many of the buildings, including the hospital wing, are still intact, trespassing is illegal. Newer buildings have been constructed amongst the grounds that once comprised Letchworth Village. Here's where here's where it really gets me. I did my some continued research and started looking at some maps. I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah, you, you I I added this in. Um, so included amongst the what was once the grounds of Letchworth Village, between Letchworth Village and where the cemetery is. There is now a relatively new elementary school and middle school. And the middle school, as a matter of fact, is named Fieldstone Middle School, which is named as a nod to the old stone buildings that comprise Letchworth Village. How many spirits are in the school? I want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I really want to know how many spirits are in the school now. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but to kind of go in and look at the map. And, oh, yeah, the, the Palisade Parkway runs right through that area as well. Oh, of course. Yeah, so you got this highway that runs right between the village and the cemetery, and the schools are tucked in next to kind of the highway area. And yeah, yeah. So okay, it, so, so go on the hike. <laughs> so yeah, and it, so if you, if you aren't screaming, you know, squeamish enough already about and all railing this, railing against the injustices of the past, like me. Yes. Okay, so um, go on the hike and go up to the cemetery. Uh, hikers up there have reported hearing crying, whimpering, and echoing in the cemetery. As they pass, some have caught glimpses of uh, people in medical gowns wandering among the graves, but the figures never show up 
in photographs. And this is probably how their relatives would have wanted it. So they knew they were hidden away. They don't allow themselves to be documented in any way, shape, or form. But you can view them with your eye, just not your camera. I'm actually curious if they show up on thermal. Good question. I, I'd be really curious. Go for a walk? Uh, this, is, this is one that keeps me the heebie jeebies. Yeah, go for a walk. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'd have to have bring somebody with a thermal camera. <laughs> oh, no, we have a thermal camera. We have camera. a thermal camera. I keep forgetting we have a thermal camera. Courtesy of our friend Steve Dills. Hey, Steve. All right, so we're going to jump back down to North Carolina. Um, this is an old Cherokee. Uh, we're getting tale. closer to home. Closer to home. <laughs> And this one gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't want to meet this person at all. Uh, but this is the Nolan Creek Trail in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, you start um, the Nolan Creek hike from the trailhead on Lakeview Drive and head as far north as you want to go. The lower cemetery is on a spur at about mile 2.8 and the upper, cem upper cemetery is at 4.4 uh, mile. On the, they're both on the right, and you can also day hike or tent hike uh, at backcountry number 65 or 64 is where you can tent. Um, now, the stories, there's a lot of stories about the Great Smoky Mountain, so we're going to come probably end up coming back here at some point in time again. Uh, again, I have over 200 hike stories at this point that I have started reading, um, so we're going to do this quite a bit. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, the tale that comes out of here, as I mentioned, is an old Cherokee uh, legend and real-life happenstance from that area. The Cherokees believed in a terrible ogress uh, who lived in the Smokies. She could assume any human form or appearance to suit her evil purposes. So she's a shapeshifter. Uh, often her purpose was to feast on children. Specifically, she liked their liver. Uh, she would assume the image of a tender, grandmotherly old woman. And with this disguise, uh, even with this disguise, her skin was as hard as stone. No human weapon was known to be able to penetrate it. This is, uh, there was only one tell, or tell, I should say, that uh, this grandmotherly person was this shapeshifter, and that was uh, that she had on her hand a uh, obsidian spear-like finger uh, that she actually used to stab unsuspecting children. Uh, it was shaped like an awl, so it's, you know your carpentry tools, a nice long spear on your finger. And so thus her name was Spearfinger. As the legend goes, Spearfinger would assume her grandmother, grandmotherly appearance come down from the ridges to troll for small children along the north trail of Lake Montana. The Cherokee children would often be berry picking in this area, and so it was a right place for her to go hunting. She would call to them, come my grandchildren, enticing them to come closer to her. She would then sit on a local log or a rock, pick them up, put them on her lap, and it was about to act like she was going to comb their hair. Instead, she would use that long finger made of obsidian, pierce them through the heart from the back, and then take them off and devour their liver. Yummy. Roasted yeah, liver. liver. I liver. never care for liver, by the way. Her <laughs> cat does. Yeah, the cat loves it. She's got stopped off somewhere. Um, now, the uh, the local tale that's there is that of a, a settler who actually lived in this area, and his daughter unfortunately went missing near the Nolan Creek Trail at the north end of Lake Montana. We don't know if she was a victim of Spearfinger. Did she drown in the lake? All we know is she disappeared. Uh, and he went looking for her, and uh, unfortunately he ran into a group of um, Native Americans and was ambushed and murdered by them. Uh, he is actually seen as a light, a lamp light uh, of an old-fashioned lantern, walking through the woods. He is known to be very helpful. He will lead uh, lost hikers out of the woods back to the trailhead if they get lost. Uh, others warn you that maybe this might not be the settler, this could be Spearfinger as well. If you're an adult, she might be leaving you out of the area so she can um, get your children. So watch your children in this area. I believe that is the cat playing with her um, spinny toy that can't spin right now. I'm going to check on her. Is that okay? She's right over there. Oh, she is? Yeah, that's right back over here. Eris oh. has got a maze of caves right now. <laughs> Do you know there? It sounded like it was coming from over there. Anyway, so Chris is hunting for the cat. 
Um, now, the other stories that happen around here that uh, there's an ominous fog that hangs around in these mountains, uh, and that is often when the light will be seen um, hanging around the lower and upper Nolan cemeteries. As I said, it's the size and shape of an old-fashioned lantern uh, that you would be hand-holding like this and wandering through, and it actually moves very similar to a swinging lantern at that point in time. The cat's okay, everybody. Okay, good. Uh, again, remember, Spearfinger is not friendly, so if you see a grandmotherly old woman, run quickly in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're going to hop up to um, the Appalachian Trail here yeah, in Virginia. Yeah, back to Virginia. We're, we're, we're wrapping up in Virginia. Um, the Appalachian Trail, unfortunately, has got a lot, a lot of ghost stories. There have been a number of people who have disappeared on this trail. Um, so do be careful when you're hiking. Always uh, hike with a group. Always let people know where you are. Um, when you are hiking along it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful trail, but again, there are some very dangerous aspects to it. Okay. I put a question, uh, at Wakefield, George Washington birthplace, mm -hmm. have you ever heard of the trails, of uh, there being any reports of hauntings there? Um, I think we, wait, Wakefield, thought the Pokes Creek, wasn't it? Washington birthplace? George Washington. I thought there was some ghost, uh, a yeah, ghost story. Yeah, uh, I just got actually the um, the Washington, D.C. revisited book, and that actually has his birthplace in it. I haven't read that story yet. So. Got a little research to do there. Yeah, I, I ordered a lot of books. There's always, there's always more research on to Amazon. do. Amazon, <laughs> a lot of books, and I haven't read them all yet. And Trina here says that she has a cabin about an hour from... Uh, Cherokee. Oh, so cool. she's going to have to check that out. Yes, please report back. Yes, Do some she, scouting with us. She has uh, seen some orbs by the cabin that she has there. Cool. Yes. Well, as we said, the Smokies are quite haunted up there. I mean, there's at least five stories that I've read so far um, in the books that I've gotten through yet. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot of stories. As I said, I had over 200 plus stories. <laughs> All right, so we're so, going to talk about uh, Bluff Mountain and the Punchbowl Shelter. So this is in George Washington National Forest, as we mentioned, along the Appalachian Trail. And uh, what you need to do is you need to go to the town of Snowden. You'll find a trailhead marker near the intersection of Virginia 130 and Virginia H12. And you'll take a, a, uh, <clears throat> Appalachian Trail 11 mile, the Appalachian Trail 11 miles north, covering about 2,700 feet of elevation. And this is the smallest bluff mountain, by the way. This bluff mountain actually very rarely gets onto a topographical map because it is short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, at that point, you'll find the Punch Bowl Lean To. Uh, you'll crest the uh, the bluff mountain at about near mile nine point nine and a half. And uh, it's uh, almost 3,400 feet. It's mm -hmm. a, you know has some has some heft to it, but it is the um, shortest amongst them, so uh, it can be kind of easily overlooked. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, to spend the night in the lean-to, it's first come, first served, and uh, the following morning you can retrace your steps back out, or you can continue up the trail just another half a mile to reach the Blue Ridge Parkway and have a pre-arranged shuttle pick you up there. Now, there are dozens of bluff mountains in the United States, and at least four of them are in Virginia alone. Yeah, so make sure going to the right bluff mountain. Yes, <laughs> um, and uh, the, the least impressive one barely surpasses this 300-foot mark. Um, but it does, however, display a summit plaque, and it honors one Adi Klein Powell, the youngest person to summit the bluff's spruce-covered slopes at the time, but his journey was unfortunately a fatal mistake. Yeah, he did not mean to summit. No. Adi lived with his parents and seven brothers and sisters in Amherst County, just east of the Blue Ridge foothills. On November 9, 1891, the blue-eyed, sandy-haired boy walked into the one-room Tower Hill schoolhouse with the other children like he always did. It was chilly and the aftermath of the first snowstorm of the season. Adi's teacher had burned through all the firewood supply already, and the first task of the day for the children and her was to go gather more firewood. After the gathering was completed, the teacher noticed that Adi had not returned to the school, and unfortunately he never did. A community-wide search failed to return him before nightfall, and the temperatures dropped even more. As news of Adi's disappearance spread, the search party grew to more than a thousand people strong, but still Adi could not be found. He had vanished. 
The following spring, about five months after Adi had disappeared, a hunting dog tracked Adi's scent to the top of Bluff Mountain, seven miles from the schoolhouse and more than 2,000 feet above it. Details get fuzzy thereon, but some versions say that his remains were found with undigested chestnuts, an indication that perhaps Adi didn't suffer long. Seven miles and 2,000 feet higher. That mm -hmm. is quite the hike. And he was small. He was a youngin. Four years old? Yeah, so for him to get that far and that lost, and to be able to look for chestnuts. Yeah. You would have known about I guess that was living out there in that time. You yeah. would have known to look for even at that young age. But anyways, the hauntings. Bluff Mountain and the nearby Punchbowl Shelter are apparently home to the mischievous spirit of Adi Klein Powell. Despite the creed of mad trail magic, with it, which inspires through hikers to decorate Adi's memorial with uh, toy cars and other small trinkets, Adi has been heard shouting for help along the stretch of, tra of trail north of Bluff. Worse, he torments hikers who are posting up in the Punchbowl Shelter, a three-sided lean-to just north of the mountain off the Appalachian Trail. Hiker reports in the shelter's logbook describe a ghost that prides them in the ribs while they sleep and messes with their belongings and laments that he can't find his parents. One entry details a through hiker's encounter with Adi's sobbing ghost in the shelter. He says he awoke in the middle of the night and clearly saw Adi's ghost huddled in the corner of the lean-to and crying. The entry states, you might think I dreamed this, and he goes on. But when I woke this morning, the clothes my pack had been taken out and folded into little squares. There was a pile of tried chestnuts on them as well. That is our sad tale of poor little Adi. Now there's another um, ghost story because I noticed a couple people here were commenting about going hiking with their Boy Scout troops. And this is a fun one outside of Charlottesville. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so this is actually the tale of the six uh, dead scouts that uh, happened outside at the witch's mansion up there. And Eris is going to join us for this one, so I'm going to pick her up. What? Oh, hello, my baby girl. Um, so this is a new Boy Scout uh, troop who decided, or master who decided to uh, take his troop out and go hiking in one of the local... Uh, forested areas near this estate and everybody knew that this estate was uh, a witch's house that nobody should go near it it is cursed uh, but unfortunately the uh, new uh, boy scout master did not know this he did not know the tales about this place and they hiked a little too far in he settled everybody down into their tents and uh, he thought everybody had gone to sleep but he woke up and decided to do a, a check, a tent check, and there was absolutely nobody in their tents. So he grabbed his flashlight and he started searching and he started walking up towards the estate and he could always hear the boys just ahead of him, but he could never see them. He gets to the estate and he finds the door open. He knocks on it and he calls for the boys to come out. Again, he hears them inside, but he does not see them. So he opens the door and he's like, oh my God, I got I gotta get them out of here. They're trespassing. This is no good. Um, so he goes into the house and he starts searching for them. It's covered in dust. It's filthy. It's full of cobwebs. He finds one of the boys' caps on the ground and he picks it up and it's near the door to the basement. So he goes downstairs thinking that's where they've all gone. And he goes down in there and he's searching and he's searching. He cannot find them. He turns around to see a ghastly female figure behind him scares him half to death. He drops his flashlight. He runs out of the house. He turns around, looks back in, and there's nobody behind him, pulls a second flashlight out. He was at least well prepared. Goes back in the house, cannot find them, can't find his flashlight, can't find the hat that was in there. Goes back to the campsite. And when he gets there, he sees blood. And he starts looking in the tents and he finds all of his campers are dead, mutilated. He runs screaming, stumbles onto the driveway to the house, follows that back out to the road, ends up coming across a cop who was doing nightly rounds. They lead him back to the um, tent. They cannot find these bodies, but they do find in a log next to his tent a bloody knife. The next day, six white birches appear 
on the road near where he ran into police officers. And those birches can never be taken down, cannot be damaged in any way. They believe that these are the souls of the six boys that he took camping. Uh, he was tried. He was found not able to be uh, to go through for um, trial because of insanity reasons, and he ends up dying in an asylum. When he dies, a seventh birch appears, but not tall and straight and majestic like the other six. This one is crooked and bent and ugly, and many believe this shows the madness that was in the, uh, the Boy Scout troop leader and uh, that he is always there now with his other troops. Now, this is a folk tale from this area. Uh, nobody has been able to actually pin a, a real piece of um, fact to that story. It's just everybody knows about this haunted witch's mansion and these poor six boys who were murdered. Um, but as I said, it is a, a local legend. It is not a full fact murder that happened. <laughs> Um, but the area is private. You cannot go up on that estate. Um, it is gated off, and uh, it's been known to have some shootings go on if you do trespass up in that area, so don't do it. Yes. But I always found that one to be really interesting. I told my sister that story right before my nephew went on his first Boy Scout camping trip. She did not forgive me. <laughs> Can't imagine why. I had just learned the story, and I had to share it. She's like, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our evening for the night. But we will be back next week, as we have already mentioned. And uh, I see some, some of you are already looking forward to it. Glenn, we are looking forward to having you tune in. And I'm assuming Patrick will, will probably enjoy having you on the show. And uh, Trisha and everybody else who's commenting and joining us on these live streams, uh, we greatly appreciate you tuning in. appreciate you chiming in and uh, following us. Uh, uh, as always, uh, we'll see our majestic demon kitty, as you can yes. see her, her eyes flashing every now and then. <laughs> we love her. She is the princess. Yes. But yeah, let your friends know that we're doing this. Uh, we are going to keep doing this uh, for for a while. And uh, <laughs> sounds like you're a good aunt. <laughs> <laughs> I will totally tell my niece and nephew horror stories. It's awesome. Yes, I'm that aunt. I will take them paranormal hunting too when they're when they want to. Yeah. But yeah, so we will be back next week, and next week theme, next week's theme is haunted royal palaces. Haunted royal palaces. So Thank you, Henry the Eighth. He yes. gave us a lot of material. But we're um, we're not going to stay just in England. Uh, we will talk about some of them, but we're going to bounce around the UK. Um, I think I may have found one or two in Japan. I'm still kind of researching, trying to find the meat of the stories. Uh, but we are still going to talk about the one haunted royal palace that we have here in the United States. And that is the Iolani um, Palace in Hawaii. Uh, some of you may not remember, but Hawaii was a royal kingdom before, well, we took it over. In a not-so-nice way. Yeah. But we'll get to that story, because that's part of the story. <laughs> um, but it is a really awesome um, palace. If you ever get a chance to go to Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, you will be able to see it. I actually did go, um, and this was my 10th grade history project I think it was 10th grade uh, for world history uh, we were doing various uh, parts of US history and well my teacher I told her I was going to be spending two weeks in Hawaii and I could do research while I was there and so she said great you're gonna research the Hawaiian royal family I'm like awesome uh, so that was my project and I loved it and it was a great place to go and um, to go and visit and hang out and they're working dutifully to restore it uh, there's actually seven royal palaces uh, that I discovered recently in this research. Um, I have not found any other ghost stories <laughs> um, the other palaces, but the, the big palace does have ghost stories, and we will be talking about that. So, man, they, actually, we went kind of long tonight. Hour 20. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> we were chatty tonight. Yes, we were. Well, yes. We, we talked for like 15 minutes about life, life. being rough. <laughs> <laughs> for everybody. Yes. <laughs> And well, love fest with Eris because she likes to be cuddled. Yes. And scritchied and everything else. Yep. She probably wants us to come back down to the couch for more of that. Yes. And she probably wants food, too. No, I fed her right before we started. She probably wants more food. Probably. She is a cat. She is. All right. So anyway. with that, anyway, <laughs> thanks again, folks. Uh, appreciate y'all tuning in, and we will see you next week. If you want to drop us any notes or anything in the meantime, you can uh, always reach us on Facebook. Just shoot us a message. And uh, y'all take care, stay safe, and stay healthy out there. Have Bye a good night. Bye.